Hello and welcome to the weekly Bible study from the Green Bar Valley Church of the Nazarene that is taken from the Church of the Nazarene publication Faith Connection. We are continuing in the unit called Profiles of God and today we're going to take a look at the scripture verse of 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 13 to 25 and we are looking at the attribute of God as holy but before we start our reading of our scripture verse today let's open up with a quick prayer father you have brought us into a new year lord all things are new through you once we accept you as our father once we invite you into our hearts and in our lives, you tell us that we are new creations. We are born again. Let us start this new year anew with you to strengthen our bonds with you, to strengthen our knowledge of you, and to strengthen our life as Christians as you would have us to live it. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. We love you, and we praise your name. And it is in the great name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray to you. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. As I said, we are still in our unit called Profiles of God. And we have seen that God is love, God is gracious, God is everywhere. God is all things. So let's take a look at God is holy. And let's start, as I said, with the scripture verse of the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. And we are going to read verses 13 through 25. Here is the word of the Lord. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Though you believe through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and all the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. And that is the word of the Lord. God's attribute of holiness is central to who he is. But it is also central to the, the Christian life as we reflect God's holiness. 
And so we need to find encouragement for holy living and become accountable through meaningful relationships with others, other believers. God is holy. What does this mean? Well, the Hebrew meaning behind the word holy is set apart, separate. Now, why is God's holiness important to Christians? God is set apart, and sometimes that's hard for us to visualize because we think of heaven somewhere up there. But our minds can only grasp the small amount of universe that we can comprehend. Think of it this way. To create the universe as God is the creator, to create the universe, he could not be part of the universe. Just as we create cars and factories, the cars don't create themselves. Something outside of the car creates it. Something outside of the universe created it and us, and that something was God. And God is set apart from this world and from sin. Now the author of our lesson today talks about being uh, very early in his pastorate. And here, here's what he says. Many years ago, my first pastorate, a young woman who attended my church called in the early evening in a panic. She had gone to Bible study and read about sanctification and holiness, and it frightened her. What did this suggest about her relationship with God? How could she know that she was a child of God? She could hardly talk through her tears because she was relatively new to the church. The idea of a deeper work of God in her life was difficult to understand. I explained that her walk with God needed to go deeper. We talked about God's extreme love for her. We talked about breaking the power of sin. So we talked about, and, and she began to understand the holiness that was about a fuller and more intimate relationship with God. We talked for about an hour, and her tears of confusion gave way to peace in her heart. Now, this passage that we just read from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, lays the foundation for understanding the holiness of God and the corresponding calls for humans to be holy. So, let's take this verse apart and look at it in sections. Let's start with verse the first three verses that we've read, 13 through 16. The Christian life requires that we be alert and present. Peter calls on his readers to set your, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. This should remind us that faith is not only a gift of God, but also a conviction that we must embrace. The link between the full revelation of Christ and our present striving to live is a clear indication that obtaining holiness is a gracious achievement. This lifestyle is about avoiding the pitfalls of secular culture and choosing by the grace of God the transformation possible through Jesus Christ. Evil desires are those that lead us to accept the path of sin instead of the blessing of holiness. Ignorance is a symbol for a disengaged and sinful life. Ignorant of the word of God, ignorant of what 
God can do in our lives and ignorant of what he is calling us to do. And that causes us to be disengaged and to live a sinful life, to live as the world lives. Now Peter urges the reader to be obedient, alert, and engage children as they embrace holiness. The foundation of the Christian life is holiness. We have been set aside by God for God, for His purpose, for the work that He wants to do through us in His world, in His creation, in our relationship with others, both Christians and non-Christians. That is the foundation of the Christian life. It is important to note that holiness is not an ideal, but a realization of the nature of God. Because God is holy, we not only understand what sanctity looks like, and we see it in Jesus, God's desire is that we be like Him, holy. Remember, the Bible tells us that once we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and we confess our sins, God looks upon us the same as He looks upon His Son Jesus. In His eyes we have become like Him. God is wholly different, but remember He is present. There is no contradiction between radical holiness and, and human life. And we know this through the Incarnation. Jesus was fully God and fully human. So that we can be fully human and holy, being Christ-like. The call to embrace holiness emerges from the very nature of God. Because God is holy, He calls us to be holy. But He has given us a way to do that. And that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let's take a look at the next four verses, 17 through 21. Peter urges, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Now this re reminds the readers of two important truths. First, God calls us to live here and now. He put us here, and he put us here for a reason. That was determined well before we were even born, or even conceived. Holiness engages life. Second, we live for now as citizens of another kingdom. Remember, once we have accepted Jesus, we become citizens of the kingdom of God. In many ways, you're already in heaven. But we're still in this other kingdom called the world. Believers are resident foreigners. If you have ever traveled to another country and spent any time there, you go through what we call culture shock. All of a sudden things are just, wow, they're different. Or, for example, people who have lived a rural life their entire life time and go to a big city such as New York. It's a different world. They're foreigners. Things are so much different. We need to be foreigners in the world. We need to be different than the world. And that's what holiness is. Here, Peter contrast the emptiness of the way of life inherited from our ancestors 
Okay, original sin. With the gift of the precious blood of Christ. Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world and in his last times revealed the holiness of God. When Jesus walked this earth, he showed us what the holiness of God looks like. The Son of God incarnate in time is the key to believing in God. It is through Jesus that we are able to place our hope in God. The holiness of God comes clearly into view because Christ was without blemish or lured by the temptations of the world. Remember, Jesus told us, you will have problems in this world, but do not fear because I have overcome this world. In today's society, we'd probably say, been there, done that, and got the t-shirt. That's Jesus. He's, he's faced everything that we could ever face in our life. And so let's look at the last three verses of 1 Peter, 22 through 25. Purification comes through obedience to the truth found in Jesus Christ. One of the marks of holiness is the capacity to love one another. Jesus models this love by redeeming us. He loved us so much that he died for us. He died that we may be forgiven of our sins. He was the unblemished lamb that was required to shed the blood. And so we are bought, we are paid for, if you will, by the blood of Jesus. The connection between love of God and love of neighbor defines holiness in practical terms. Obedience also connects Peter's admonition to have alert minds. Therefore, a key element of holiness comes into view. Believing, obeying, and loving. And this theme ex exists throughout the scripture. Peter f affirms, for you have been born again. Remember, Jesus told Nicodemus that to enter heaven, we must be born again. Nicodemus did not understand what he was saying. This reminds us that holiness is not about the slavish human striving to be good or moral. Remember, there is nothing that we can do to earn holiness. It's about a genuine transformation in the heart through faith. Holiness is not a code of righteousness. It is a fundamental change in our heart. We talked earlier about love comes from God through us to others. But that love comes through our heart. And our heart has to be changed for it to be the conduit of God's love for others. To be sure, holiness requires our response, our obedience, but it is not a human achievement. Holiness represents a cooperation between the grace of God and our deliberate intention to be like Christ through the Spirit. Peter reminds us all people are like grass. The world is passing away along with everything in it. John Wesley observes, every human creature is transient and withering as grass. Death is a reality for life. We are dying from the very day that we are born. But by the grace of God, the enduring word touches our life. This closing, the, the, this closing thought in this passage reminds us that the holiness depends upon God. Therefore, 
we will endure through the graciousness of God that our hope rests in God and in nothing else. The old song, Holiness Forevermore, declares there is a blessed triumphant song, Holiness Forevermore. Now, let's put the issue of holiness in perspective. Holiness is not a secondary issue, nor a temporary one. Our call to holiness is central because it essentially expresses who God is and what he calls us to be. It is a matter rooted in the deep character of God. It's an issue at the heart of his purpose for us. To be like him is to reflect his holiness. Holy living is an essential element of many religions around the world. Rudolf Otto, an important theologian, wrote the idea of the holy. He developed the thesis in this volume that essentially tremendous mystery informs religion in life. Peter understands that this mystery is defined by awe and love. One of the greatest misunderstandings of being holy or sanctification is that it is a once and for all one-time event. A careful study of scripture consistently reveals that sanctification is both a crisis experience and a lifetime process. It is instantaneous, but then it continues on. We are sanctified when we accept Jesus as our Savior, and we are being sanctified in a continual process. A daily sacrifice of self and infilling of the Holy Spirit of God are necessary for an ongoing life of holiness. Now, today's scripture calls us to be holy because God is holy and to live a holy life as foreigners in an unholy world. Let's examine the challenges of engaging our world with the holiness message while living counter-culturally. Perhaps our biggest responsibilities as Christian aliens in this world is capsulated in verses 15 and 16. In calling us to be holy as he is holy, rather than secluding himself from his creation, God invites us into a fuller and more complete participation with him in his holiness. Now how are we as mere humans able to fulfill the command to be holy? What attributes of God within his holiness are patterned for us to embody? Well, think about the attributes of God that, that we have studied in previous weeks of this series. Faithfulness, compassion, grace, love, power. We cannot achieve any of these on our own. It's only through the enabling presence of His Holy Spirit living and working in us that we are able to do that. How is living a holy life a physical reputation of God for all people with whom we come into contact? We can't see God. No one can see God. Jesus tells us the only one who could see God was the one who came from God, meaning him. But, 
Jesus also said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. What he is calling us to do is live like him so that others may see the Father through us. Being holy as God is holy and living this holy life in an unholy world requires intentional action. And it begins with our thinking. Go back to verse 13. What role does an alert mind playing in living a holy life? To what are we to be alert? We need to be alert of everything around us especially the needs of our neighbors. Especially being alert that when we have opportunities to minister to others. But we also have to be alert to the temptations and schemes of Satan. Remember, he wants to take us off the path that we're on. He wants to recapture us. Why is a fully sober mind an integral part of being holy as God is holy? Sober thinking denotes serious considerations, self-discipline, self-control. Think about some of the earthly distractions that might dull our senses if we're not disciplined and focused on God. There are so many of them. The entire world can be a distraction if we let it. And so the desire for conforming within our culture is a strong, strong lure to many Christians. We want to fit in. We want to be friends with everybody. We want to be part of society. But again, Peter tells us, no, we need to live as foreigners in this society. And we need to counteract the temptation to return to our previous unregenerated lifestyle, our sinful lifestyle. And we do that by intentionally conforming to God's image of wholeness. Since we are citizens of another world, think of this, consider this, we are actually citizens of another world. Not this earthly one. We are citizens of heaven. We are citizens of God's kingdom. That makes it all the more important that we set our hope fully on God's grace. And Peter tells us that grace will be fully revealed at the second coming of Christ. Now, how can we maintain this separateness without losing our witness and influence to bring others to Christ? Here's the key. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And we have to remember that it's not, if you will, outer cleanliness, but it's inner holiness and the perishable with the imperishable. It is not that we call ourselves righteous but that we live the holy life. And remember in the Old Testament, some of the rules of the temple is that you had to purify yourself before going into the temple, especially the priests, priests that were going to the inner part of the temple. They had to be 
outwardly purified. But with a holy God, we need to be purified inside. Our hearts need to be purified. And what is an indication of a pure heart? Sincere love. Loving one another deeply from the heart. Love is a defining quality whereby the world will know that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Where love is lacking, holy living is incomplete. Jesus talked about love several times in his last days. Love as I have loved you. Put down your life for a neighbor if required. That's what Jesus is saying. When asked what is the greatest commandment, he said, love God, and the second is like it, love one another. Love is the basis of everything that God does. He loves us, therefore he can provide us with the grace to forgive us, to care for us. Love is the basis, and we are called to love others. Now, this passage of 1 Peter ends with the words from Isaiah 46 through 8 about the grass and the fields of flowers. And that's how temporary life of humankind is compared. Grass and fields of flowers are beautiful in their time, but they wither and fall. They all perish. What is the perishable seed of which we are born that Peter talks about in verse 23? The human flesh, the human body. It's perishable. What is the imperishable seed that defines our true existence? Through the living, enduring word of God. We have life everlasting. As holy followers of God, we live in the tension of two worlds. How then can we live in this perishable word, world with the imperishable gift of God's holiness within us? We must continually remember that we are called to be salt and light in the world, yet citizens of a heavenly world. In today's age, we are all called to be ambassadors of God, to represent God. When countries appoint ambassadors to another country, that ambassador is to reflect and is to represent the country that sends him. We are to be ambassadors of God. God has sent us to this earthly world to represent him. What do you need to do this week to be holy as God is holy? Maybe devote more time to personal relationship to God in prayer and Bible studies. Maybe surrender a habit, a relationship, or, or something you love but is not appropriate to a holiness life. Or maybe it's just simply let go and let God. Let's close in prayer. Father, being holy is who you are. It is what you are. You are set aside, different, other. Help us to understand what it means to be holy. Help us to understand your call to us to be holy in this unholy world. Strengthen us through your spirit, Lord. 
Give us the strength, the knowledge, and the courage that we need to be your ambassador in this fallen world. Help us to be the light and salt that this world needs. Help us, Lord, just to love one another unconditionally. And it's in the great name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week.